<laughs> okay, enough with that aside. When we're getting regression results, one way that we can get them is in ANOVA form. If you remember, ANOVA is just a special case of regression. It is regression just with a categorical predictor. All this stuff you should recognize. What we're basically doing is we're breaking out parts of the probability in the outcome and deciding uh, where if we can explain that variability or if we can't with the information we have from the predictors. So the regression line shows us what we can explain. It's a difference between our predicted value and it doesn't really show up well, but that should be a y bar. So it's y hat minus y bar. So it's a difference between what we predict for each person minus the overall mean squared and we add all that up. That's the sum of squares regression. The sum of squares residual is the difference between the observed and the predicted values squared and summed up. That ends up giving us an F statistic, which tells us if our model overall, if the predictors overall, are able to significantly explain the outcome. So when it comes to inference, there's really a couple things that we can infer from a regression model. The first one is R squared. That's going to tell us how our overall model is, just like what we talked about with the ANOVA table. Do our uh, predictors as a whole significantly predict our outcome? Next one is regression coefficients. This one's also very important. Both of these are used basically every time you use a regression. The third one is the conditional means. This one is not always used, but it can be very important and we're gonna talk about what it means. First one, when we're making inference about R squared, this tests the entire model. So the question that it's answering is, do the predictors together have a relationship with the outcome? We may wonder, all of these different measures of socioeconomic status, do they predict this outcome? The R squared is going to answer that question. It is very common to discuss the model as a whole before discussing the individual predictors as well. So even if the whole model isn't of interest, all the predictors together, you may want to still report the model as a whole explained the outcome and then go into what we're going to talk about next with the individual coefficients. Here's an example uh, of the way that you can interpret this output. So let's say we're looking at the R squared. The test statistic that it gives us is the F statistic. That's what's going to give us the P value. And we can say if it's less than 0.05, that suggests there's a relationship among the predictors and the outcome. One way that we could interpret this, for example, the model that included word count explained 46% more of the variance in the narrative quality and was significantly better than, in this case, if we don't have another model to compare to, it's just going to be to the null model. The null model here is just no predictors. Essentially, it's saying how well does just knowing the mean of our outcome help us understand the outcome? So saying it, it explained 46% more of the variance in the narrative quality and was significantly better than the null model, that's saying that this is explaining 46% of the variance. We also can compare to other models. So you can have a model that has fewer predictors and then you can add predictors to it and you can compare those models to each other. That's another way to use R squared. Important things to know here is that R squared provides a F statistic, which gives you a P value. And the way that you're gonna interpret it is using the R squared. How much of the variance did it explain? The null hypothesis with the R squared is that the model is no better than the comparison model, either a null model or another nested model. And the alternative is that the model is better than the comparison. So again, the model explained 46% of the variation in narrative quality and significantly better than the null model in this case.
Another thing that we often want to make inference about is the regression coefficients themselves. What's nice about this is that it tests each individual predictor independently. In other words, it's saying, does each predictor have a relationship with the outcome? In my experience, it's the most common way of interpreting regression. It tells you specifically what the relationship is between one predictor and the outcome controlling for the others. We've gone over lots of examples of interpreting this, but I really want you to understand it. So the statistic of interest is usually the uh, B or standardized B. Um, the test statistic in this case is a T statistic. It's gonna give us a P value. It suggests if it's below the threshold that there's a relationship among this predictor and the outcome. And the example is controlling for the covariates for a one word increase in word count, there's an associated increase of 0.05 in the narrative quality. It's a great way of interpreting the results that we had earlier. We do the same tests for the standardized coefficients as well, just with standardized variables instead of the raw ones. Which means the results will actually be the same for inference, we'll just be using different units for them. What I'm trying to say with that is when, if we were to use a standardized uh, coefficient or an unstandardized one, the p-value is going to be the same. So our inference will be the same. We'll say whether there's an effect or not the same way, but the units of it will be different. We'll say, uh, one is in standard deviation units, the other one's in the raw units. An example of that is controlling for the covariates for one standard deviation increase in word count. There's an associated decrease of 0.68 standard deviation units in the outcome. So it still was the same p-value, but our units were different. And so was the beta because now it's a standardized version of it. Again, we're gonna talk about effect sizes in more detail in unit three. We're gonna talk about standardized and unstandardized a little bit more, but this is important for you to understand that inference will be the same, whether it's standardized or not. When it comes to the important pieces of the coefficients, there's really the two pieces. There's the estimate itself, which is obviously important because that's telling us the relationship. The other piece is the standard error of the estimate. That is actually what's gonna give us the information to do the null hypothesis test. And what we haven't talked about much yet is the confidence intervals. The estimate is going to come in two forms, right? We have the simple regression estimate, which is just the covariance of X and Y divided by the variance of X. We could do that by hand, we won't, but we could. Multiple regression, all the coefficients are estimated with one equation. All of it comes out in one using that uh, linear algebra approach. We could also do that by hand. We won't, but we could. The standard error though is going to be built of this. So for each coefficient, the standard error looks like we have the MS residual, which is basically an estimate of the variance of the residuals, divided by the sample size, N, times the variance of our X variable that is associated with that coefficient. So XJ goes with BJ. And then it's times by this special thing, this one minus R squared J. That's a very special thing that actually impacts our results a lot and only comes up when we're using multiple regression. So again, the MS residual is the estimate of the variance of the residuals, n is a sample size, bar xj is the variance of that predictor, and then this last thing is r squared j here is the r squared from the model with all the variables, but j. And this is called the tolerance, 
We're going to talk about what that piece means, the tolerance, in just a moment. But one thing that I really want to highlight is what is going to increase your standard error? Because these are things that are going to reduce your ability to be able to find an effect out there. It's going to make your uncertainty in your estimate bigger. So what increases the SE? Well, if the residuals have more variability. In other words, if we're not explaining very much of our outcome, the residuals will be bigger. And so the variance of our residuals will be bigger. So having a better model that understands the outcome better is going to reduce our standard error of our estimates. The better the model, the smaller the standard errors in general, holding everything else constant. If the variability in xj goes down, that actually increases the standard error. So you want to have a lot of variability in your predictors. If you only have a few uh, things that are actually showing up in your predictor, only a few levels, it's going to actually hurt your ability to uh, find significance there. It's going to hurt your, your, it's going to increase your uncertainty. Another one is that if your sample size is lower, that's also going to increase your SE. Bigger samples, smaller SE, smaller uncertainty. And then the last one, a smaller tolerance is going to mean the SE is going to increase. We're actually going to redefine that last piece, so don't focus on it too much here. We're going to redefine it in a way that's a little bit easier to understand. But the three, the MS residual, the variance of X, and the N are really important to know how can I increase my certainty in this model or decrease the uncertainty. All right, so I told you I was going to define this better. The tolerance is a measure of the independence of XJ from the other predictors. In other words, how much overlap do the Venn diagram circles have over each other? If there's a lot of overlap, then we're going to have high uh, collinearity. We're going to have problems with the tolerance. The best way I think to think about this and what you're actually getting is what's called the variance inflation factor for each variable, for each predictor. And it's just the inverse of the tolerance. So what's nice about the variance inflation factor is I think it actually names it pretty well. It's saying how much of the variance is being inflated, essentially. Are you inflating the variance by some factor? And this is going to be a measure of that. And smaller is better. So if the variance inflation factor is big, that means you have high collinearity. That means your standard, your Venn diagram circles are really overlapping. When your variance inflation factor is really small, that means they're not overlapping very much at all, which means there's not very much collinearity. And that is actually going to help your uh, standard errors be smaller. One way that actually helps to see that is if we look here, we can redefine this a little bit. So we can say the standard error is actually the square root of our variance inflation factor times those other pieces, the MS residual, the N, and the variance of X. So if the variance inflation factor goes up, your standard error goes up. If MS residual goes up, your standard error goes up. If your N goes up, your standard error goes down. And if your variance of X goes up, your standard error goes down. If this is confusing, review this a number of times because this is a very important concept. One thing to note about the variance inflation factor is that it doesn't hurt you a ton until you reach a threshold where it really, really starts to hurt you. So the standard error is on the Y axis. The R squared J is on the bottom. And then I label each variance inflation factor level. What you're seeing is that the standard error doesn't really go up, up much. Even as the variance inflation factor is starting to get a little bit bigger, even at two and three, it's not getting huge yet. But somewhere around four, five, 10, 
it just blows up. Once your variance inflation factor gets really big where the circles are really overlapping each other, then what happens with the model is it has very little information to use to actually understand what the relationship between those two variables are because there's so much overlap with this other variable. The model doesn't know what information goes where. And so it will tell you, I'm really uncertain about this estimate. That's what the variance inflation factor is trying to tell you is, are you making the model less certain because two variables are very, very overlapping? They're very collinear. With the standard error and understanding how it works now, we can do it, we can use it to do two important things. We can get the null hypothesis test which is all about the T statistic. So we're looking at our coefficient minus the null value of the coefficient, which is usually zero. Our null value is saying there's no relationship divided by the standard error of our coefficient, which really ends up being just our coefficient divided by the standard error of our coefficient. That gives us our T statistic, which then gives us our P value. Standard error is actually essential for that. And if the standard error gets bigger, our t-statistic will go down and our p-value will get larger. The other thing is a confidence interval. And this is a really important thing for a lot of models is being able to say where the confidence interval is around our coefficient. So the coefficient is the estimate of interest. And then we're gonna say we're 95% confident that the estimate, the true population estimate is between this lower bound and this upper bound with the coefficient that we estimated in the middle. That's going to tell us where we're 95% confident or 99% confident, depending on what alpha level you pick. What that's going to do is give us more of an idea of what the uncertainty actually means around our estimate. One problem with the null hypothesis test is that it doesn't really come with a whole lot of uncertainty tied to the interpretation, which can be problematic because it makes it sound like when we say there's an effect out there, this is the relationship. It makes it sound like we're very certain of that result. The confidence interval, even though it's using the same information, it's using a T statistic based on the alpha level that you pick and the SE, it's the same information, but it communicates it in a different way, which can be a really powerful way to communicate it. So either one is going to be using the standard error and your coefficient. Same information for the null hypothesis test and the confidence interval. All right, the last concept of this lecture is going to be the inference about conditional means. The first thing that we need to do to really talk about that is we need to talk about centering. Centering just means that we're subtracting, subtracting a centering value from it. So we can pick any value. Often you'll see the mean is picked, so it's uh, mean centered. We can use the median that's median centered or any other value that we want. When we do this, it changes the interpretation of the intercept a few. I can move my picture. So when we center a variable, it changes the meaning of the intercept. And if we want to make inference about the conditional mean, so saying the intercept is now going to tell us the average of our outcome when our predictor is at whatever level that we put as a centering value. And then the standard error is the standard error tied to the intercept on that one. So up to this point, the intercept hasn't been super useful other than in categorical variables, but now we even can use it with continuous variables. So for example, we may want to know the language ability of a child and obtain the confidence interval of that estimate for someone that is eight years old and whose mother has 15 years of schooling. So our model has these two variables in it. It has how old the child is and the education of the mother. And we want to estimate what the language ability of a child would be with those specific circumstances. So we would center our 
child age variable at eight. And we would center our mother schooling at 15. So we would do that before the model. We would make a new variable that is age minus eight. That would now be centered at eight. And we would do mother education minus 15. And that would be mother education centered at 15. And then we put that into a model. And that model now is going to have an intercept that is for a child that is eight years old and whose mother has 15 years of schooling. And it's gonna give us an estimated language ability. And the standard error of that is going to give us the uncertainty of that estimate. So we actually can give a ballpark of where children, uh, the average child should be when uh, they are eight years old and their mother has 15 years of schooling. All right, that's it for this lecture. I know there's a lot in here. This is a really important one to understand the assumptions of regression and understanding really what inference means is really important. So if you need more help or want to look at these resources, there's more about assumptions, there's checking assumptions, and there's more on conditional means and saying that was a difficult concept period. So please check out these resources and reach out if you have questions. And enjoy this quick comic and this beautiful picture of the Red Rock.